come to a crucial turning point in the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus. His Galilean ministry has come to an end and now Jesus will travel to Jerusalem. Uh, out of all the gospel writers, Luke devotes the most space uh, to recording this crucial journey. Uh, starting here in Luke 9 verse 51 and only entering Jerusalem at the end of chapter 19. And his entry into Jerusalem will be met with both praise and opposition. Some will lay their coats on the road. Uh, they will cry, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. While others will do all in their power to destroy him. But those final days in Jerusalem will end with betrayal and arrest, trial and crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. And we know that because we have the end of the story recorded here for us in the gospel accounts. But Jesus, even at this point, he knows the end that must soon come. Jesus knows the words of Isaiah 50, verses 5 to 7. You read there, the Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting, for the Lord God will help me, therefore I will not be disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. Jesus not only knows the victory that will come to pass in Jerusalem, but he knows the cost of that victory. He knows he will crush the head of the serpent. He will defeat the evil one who has blinded and enslaved so many in sin, all people in sin. But in so doing, Christ's heel will be bruised. He will suffer and he will lay down his life for his people. Uh, the things that will take place will not just be a reaction of wicked men against Jesus. Everything that takes place will happen because Jesus is determined that it must happen. He knows he must obey his father. He knows that this is the only way to save his people from their sins. He knows what must take place. And now is the time for him to journey to the fulfillment of his earthly mission. So Luke records in verse 51, Now it came to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And I find it a remarkable statement, knowing all you know, the horrors of Calvary that will follow, because Luke doesn't say that the time has come for Jesus to be delivered up, but rather the time has come for him to be received up. Yes, Jesus will be delivered up to Pilate and crucified, but beyond that, after that, he will be received up to his Father as he ascends again to the glory of heaven. Hebrews 12, 2 speaks of the very same truth and it exhorts us to follow after Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. There is joy before Jesus. Even as he turns to begin this journey to Jerusalem, that journey which will mean endurance and determination and steadfastness, he must set his face like a flint and not be distracted or dissuaded from the cross. There's also joy in it. And it's, it's a journey not only for Jesus, but for his disciples who are with him. Now, they don't yet understand what Jesus has now mentioned to them twice about his coming death and resurrection. But they still must follow wherever he goes. And as they journey with Jesus, they will soon come to understand that it will take similar endurance and determination 
steadfastness. And even for ourselves this morning here in Knock, as we follow Jesus in our lives day by day, we, we need to endure. We need to be steadfast. We too need to keep looking on to Jesus. And I trust we, we, we learn from these first disciples just what it means to steadfastly set our face upon Jesus, looking forward to the joy of the new Jerusalem and seeing Christ face to face, our glorious risen King. See, being a disciple, being a Christian, it's, it's not a walk in the park. It is a walk where we pick up our cross daily and follow Jesus. It is a life of self-denial. A life where we lose our life for the sake of Jesus. But in the end we are saved and forever with the Lord. Yes, it is a difficult journey through difficult terrain, through a dark world where the enemies of the Lord are crouching at the door. Where we too face opposition just because we follow Jesus. We will face difficult people, difficult circumstances, and difficult decisions. And therefore, we must set our faces forward, looking unto Jesus, and looking forward to the fullness of the kingdom of God. And so we start with the first difficulty then this morning in following Jesus, and that's difficult people, difficult people. Don't be looking around at anybody else. The Samaritans, they proved difficult. Jesus sent some messengers ahead to get things ready for his stay in one of the Samaritan villages. But we read in verse 53, they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. They don't want Jesus. They don't want his followers in their village because he's going to Jerusalem. And they have a massive problem with Jerusalem. They're thinking along the lines like these. Those Jews in Jerusalem, they think they have God all to themselves. They think they have a monopoly on God and a monopoly on what it qualifies to be true worship. They think that we are just racial half-breeds just because we have intermarried with some other folk round about. But them, they're nothing more than a bunch of holier-than-thou inbreeds who imagine that they're right and everybody else is wrong. They hate us. So yeah, we hate them. They really did hate each other. There was no dealings between the Jews and the Samaritans. Remember in John chapter 4, it was a shock to the Samaritan woman. Jesus spoke to her. Asked for a drink of water. But the conversation started. and She questioned Jesus then about worship. They believed it was okay to worship God in their own way, on their own mountain. Surely there was no need to go to Jerusalem. What was so special about Jerusalem? But Jesus reminded her gently that salvation is of the Jews and that he, even as a Jew, was the promised Messiah. It was a great discussion. It was great fruit that came of that. But there's no discussion here, not in this village. No, no, they don't want Jesus at all. They want, want him and his disciples just to keep on going. Luke simply records, they did not receive him. And I think that kind of covers up a whole lot of something that's not very pretty. But then we see that the hatred actually cut both ways. Yeah, the Samaritans, they have a problem with Jesus. They've got a problem with Jerusalem. But James and John... The sons of thunder. Oh, they have a massive problem with these Samaritans and their unkindness. They turn to Jesus in verse 54 and they say, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? They've got precedent for this. Come on, we want to do it. 2 Kings chapter 1. Elijah, he had indeed called down fire on his would-be assassins. They were coming for blood that day. These Samaritans, on the other hand, they're not, not out for blood this day at all. This is a different day. They just don't like Jews. Especially Jews who are devoted to what they say is the only way to worship God. And that's the temple. That's Jerusalem. They just 
have no time for that. They hate that. And sadly, James and John, they're, they're badly off course in what they say. They're simply expressing their own side of that hate between Jew and Samaritan. They're expressing that long-held grudge between Jew and Samaritan. Were these Samaritans difficult people? Yes. Were they commonly held as enemies of the Jewish people? Yes. Was their adulterated worship of practices uh, apostate and false? Yes. Yes, they were. Does that mean that we should nuke them? No. No. Remember what Jesus has already taught James and John and the rest of the disciples back in chapter 6. Verses 22 and 23 of that chapter. Blessed are you when men hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For indeed your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner the pro- their fathers did to the prophets. They're meant to be leaping for joy because of this. Luke 6, 27 and 28. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who spitefully use you. They haven't listened. Verse 37 of Luke 6. Judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Yet Jesus has already told them, here's how you deal with difficult people. Count it a blessing that you've met them. Count it a blessing that they're casting you out for my sake. Love your enemies. Do them good. Pray for them. Bless them. Don't write them off. Forgive them. And I wonder, did Jesus remind them of that past teaching in his rebuke here? In verse 55. Well, we're not told. We're just given what Luke gives us. But he does say, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. Their, their spirit was wrong. Their, their spirit was the very opposite of Jesus and his mission in verse 56. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Jesus is on a mercy mission. A seek and save mission. Not a search and destroy mission. Yes, James and John, they were serious about the fire from heaven. But they were seriously wrong. Jesus, however, has Jerusalem in his sights. Jesus is going to die for sinners. Jesus is going to die for difficult people. He's going to die for people who get it wrong. He's going to die for James and John. And although they might not quite be able to comprehend it yet, Jesus will lay down his life for Samaritans too. That ancient grudge, it will not distract Jesus from his mercy mission for both Jews and Samaritans. Jesus' parting words to the disciples before he was received up into heaven, they're recorded in Luke's uh, second book, the book of Acts, Acts 1 verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And they did. They did. They, they got it in the end. Acts 8 verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. A few verses later, there was great joy in that city. Further down, Acts 8, 25, we read about Peter and some other disciples. When they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. They got it in the end. And we too, we're on this journey of following Jesus. And yes, we are going to come across difficult people. We must keep our eyes on the cross of Christ. If we're distracted by ancient grudges or even recent grudges, then we'll lose the right spirit, the right mindset, the right goal.
commission is to be faithful witnesses, not only in Jerusalem and Judea, our own kind, people from our own background. The mission's wider than that. It includes Samaritan types, difficult types, types who may well hate us. People who think they're narrow-minded evangelical Protestants who think they've got it all sewn up and they've no time for nobody else. You may think that. But do you have time for them? Do you have time for difficult people? Or are you distracted by grudges, hatred? If so, then you lose sight of Jesus and his great commission. And then when you're reviled, you'll just revile in return. Follow Jesus means we'll actually reach out in love to difficult people, such as the Spirit of Jesus. And that must be our spirit if we're following Him. And on this journey, secondly, we, we not only encounter difficult people, but difficult circumstances. Verse 57. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. That's brilliant, isn't it? Wholehearted devotion to the Lord Jesus. It kind of throws me back to Ruth chapter 1. Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. And Ruth didn't stop there. She went on further. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. See, Ruth has considered not just the journey, but also the destination. She had even considered that, you know, following Naomi back up to Bethlehem and back, you know, to her God, to the Lord God of Israel. She had considered all of that. And that was worthy of devotion and loyalty, even unto death. this would-be disciple of Jesus in verse 57, he must know, he has to know, that following Jesus will lead him into hardship and difficulty. As we said before, Jesus, following Jesus is not a walk in the park. It's more of a journey through the wilderness. As Jesus says, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere lay his head so is this man ready for that kind of life see perhaps as they journeyed down the road with Jesus it really did look like a walk in the park walking through the countryside pleasant walk they're here with Jesus but they have been rejected in this last village no hospitality there once again there's no room in the inn for Jesus And his disciples, of course, they suffer the same fate on that occasion. They just have to move on. No comforts received. You ready for that? You ready for difficult circumstances? Paul says in 2 Timothy 2 verse 3, You must therefore endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. The problem with this would-be disciple of verse 57 is that he's kind of met Jesus on the march from Galilee to Jerusalem. And soldiers on the march, they are impressive. They've got the number one uniform on. They've got their polished boots. They've got their shiny buttons. But there's more to being a soldier than the parade ground. Yes, okay, maybe they learn discipline and so on there and the importance of carrying out orders to the letter. But it's all for the future context of battle. And those who follow Christ will face battles. They battle the habits of the old man. They have to strive to put sin to death. We face this battle of self-denial because our natural instinct is still self-defense. It's a battle to have the mind of Christ from Philippians 2 in lowliness of mind. 
let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but for the interests of others. That's a real battle, isn't it? To esteem others better than yourself. It's a battle to give of your time for others. It's a battle to, to love others who hurt you. It's a battle to give sacrificially. It's a battle to suffer discomfort for the sake of Christ our King. But the good soldier is committed to his commanding officer. He's committed to king and country. Committed to Christ. Committed to the Lord. No matter what the cost. Jesus looked forward to Jerusalem and he set his face for all that would now come to pass. He was not distracted by past comforts. He was willing to forgo them all for the sake of the mission. He was willing to suffer hardship for me and for you. And if we're following him, then we have to follow him and do likewise. There will be difficult circumstances to face. But we follow on and we look upward for the prize, for the goal, for the victory, for the inheritance that is laid up before us. And yet now we remain in the journey. We press forward. And in our discipleship, one last thing we face, and that is difficult decisions. Difficult decisions. Two further would-be disciples are singled out by Luke for our attention in verses 59 to 62. First is called by Jesus himself, follow me. Uh, and we need to bear in mind that we're on the road. Okay? We're, we're traveling, we're journeying towards Jerusalem. And the man replies, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Now to bury one's father is no small thing. Some of you, you know the pain and the responsibility of that very thing. It is perhaps one of the final ways in which we can keep the fifth commandment to honor our father and our mother is Jesus really telling this man not to worry about that honor is Jesus of a mind that well the dead are dead and that's that and no not at all Jesus stood by the grave of his friend Lazarus and he wept so what is going on here what's going on with this man I think we need to understand a little of the background of the Jews and their burial practices because they bury the dead on the day that they die. It's always a rush. But that's what they do. How come this man is on the road here with Jesus? If his father was dead already, there's no way he'd be here. And more likely, his father is nearing the end of his life. Most likely, he's not critically ill. I don't think the son would be here either if he was in that position. But the death of his father is drawing near. And it's a good thing you know, that he thinks about his father and his situation. And it's right that he wants to be there to fulfill his duty when that day finally comes. But there's something missing from this man's mind. And that is the urgency of the mission of Jesus. Jesus right now is on a gospel mission. He's not just traveling to a mission. Right now, he's on it. He's going to the cross to die for sinners. But as he goes, he journeys. As he goes, he preaches the good news of the kingdom of God. And it is an urgent thing for sinners to hear the gospel. Especially if they're drawing near to death. They must hear the gospel and repent and believe. If they're to enter the kingdom of heaven. So this man, he, you know, he wants to give his father a nice funeral. But far more pressing is that his father hears the gospel and believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. Doesn't that make sense then in the light of Jesus' response to this man's request? Verse 60, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Yes, the spiritually dead, those who aren't saved, those who aren't following Christ, they can bury the dead. Anyone can bury the dead. 
But only a true disciple can preach the gospel. And to preach the gospel, that disciple must be following Jesus, looking to him. Must be on the same mission, on the same page as Jesus. A follower of Jesus must have first loyalty to Christ and his gospel. Hard decision. But Jesus demands it from all who follow him. In verse 61, there's another would be follower. He says, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are in my house. Now, this not only sort of sounds, you know, reasonable, proper, it has biblical precedent as well. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 19. Uh, Elijah called Elisha into service by throwing his mantle upon him. Uh, Elisha was a farmer. He's out plowing, plowing a field. And uh, when this call comes to him, uh, he immediately left the plow. He ran after Elijah and he said, Please let me kiss my father and my mother and then I will follow you. Elisha did it. Why not this man? And yet Jesus is not ruling this man out in what he says. He's not saying in verse 62 that this would-be follower is unfit for the kingdom of God. Rather, he is telling him to be careful and count the cost. If he wants to do an Elisha, then do an Elisha. Well, what did Elisha do more fully? 1 Kings 19 verse 21. He took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment and gave it to the people and they ate then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant Elisha made a clean and decisive break from his farming past and devoted himself to the service of Elijah and Elijah's God there can be no half measures in following Jesus to Jerusalem this man is to join Jesus, then he must join him in that Elisha type way. Total commitment, wholly devoted to Christ and the gospel. To be looking back over one's shoulder, wondering, did I make the right decision? Is this the right thing to do? That would leave him unfit for the kingdom work. Because there will be plenty of opposition and hardship. In following Jesus, this man will certainly encounter difficult people, difficult circumstances, just as, just as Elisha did in his ministry. And yes, it is a difficult decision, but Jesus challenges him to make the right decision. No one having put in his hand to the plough and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Again, it's the same imagery from the call of Elisha. But the picture here is, you know, the farmer's plowing a field. You've got to keep his eyes forward. Keep your eye fixed on something uh, on the horizon straight ahead of you. And you just keep on looking directly for that. That way your furrow will be straight. You must not be distracted by what's over here or what's over there. Or else your furrow will be crooked. And then the field will not be rightly prepared. It won't receive the seed in the way it ought to sort of focused determination it's, it's seen by Jesus himself he set his face like a flint for Jerusalem one commentator says serving Jesus is a life with no reserve no retreat no regrets it is looking forward it is looking unto Jesus and as such it will mean some difficult decisions but those decisions will be made with that fixed look onto Christ and his kingdom. And in the end, that is the joy set before us as Christ's disciples. Yes, there will be difficult people along the way. Yes, there will be difficult circumstances and difficult decisions to be made as we travel along the way to that celestial city. But that's where we're going. Yes, we are carrying our cross in the footsteps of Jesus Christ the King. 
but we are making our way to the new Jerusalem. And we're seeking to bring others with us as we go. Yes, it's a difficult path, but we do not walk it alone. Our Savior will never leave us nor forsake us. Perhaps this morning you're feeling the difficulties that are just weighing in heavily upon you. Perhaps you've been tempted to call down the fire upon the difficult people. Perhaps you're tempted to go back and do something more comfortable. You're realizing this is definitely battlefield and not parade ground. Maybe you just want out of the battle. Perhaps you're even tempted to think that the decision to follow and serve Jesus is maybe too difficult. But let me encourage you to keep your eyes on Jesus. See the path that he took for you. See the cross. He bore it for you so that you will not have to. And see the joy that he has in store for you. But even more than that, see see Jesus himself. See your Savior and cast your cares upon him. He knows all about difficult people. He knows all about difficult circumstances. He knows all about difficult decisions. Keep looking to him. He is the author and finisher of your faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He has suffered for you. He will enable you to endure. And one day, he will welcome you before the throne of God. He is worthy. God in heaven your word searches us and it knows us so well you know exactly how we see and feel and are in the Christian life or we see these difficulties we feel them each and every day and we thank you Lord for the challenge and for the encouragement to keep going and to keep looking unto Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you understand. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that we're never alone on this road. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, where this road leads to, to seeing you face to face, to all the difficulties being over forever one day, to the glories of heaven for all eternity. Lord, will you help us, please, through the difficulties, to keep looking.